So we have gotten through. Again, please be on time. Next time you have to go to your party station. And the door shall be locked. I think I had asked you, I couldn't remember. You might have had to fill in one of the charts at the bottom. Uh, maybe the first one. Does that sound familiar? So I think we had graphed it, but we've run out a little bit of time there. So you needed to fill in that first one. So I'll let you take a second. And you can check it against me. You can check it against each other. Remember, earbuds out, cell phones on a sticky note on your desk, put them on your body. If you're tempted to use your smart watch, you should put that there as well. Okay, we have graphed this one together. We do, I forgot to fill in the church, not we, me. Okay, any questions? Okay, we jump right in then to our natural base. So you can see that when we start dealing with natural bases, we get this whole idea of, I think I mentioned to you, well, I guess I didn't last time, but as we're looking at these, I'm sneaking in just a little bit of calculus along the way. So as we approach negative infinity or positive infinity, I'm really talking about what's called a limit. So a limit is meaning that we're getting closer and closer and closer to something. So here, as I'm talking about a limit, L-I-M-I-T, it's one of the calculus topics, calculus A, that we talk about. You are getting closer and closer. You did this last year. So really, I was talking about calculus A last year. The only thing that changes when we start talking about a limit is I change the notation. Instead of just saying x approaches negative infinity or x approaches positive infinity, I change that rate notation and I just write lim, and I say I get closer and closer and closer and closer to it. Okay, I always think of a limit. You're sort of approaching how, like, in this case, you're approaching an asymptote or approaching positive infinity. Like, what are you? You could reach it, like you could actually touch it, or you could just get closer and closer to it. Okay, having older siblings, I think they often approached my limit often. Okay, if you take car rides or trips with your family or even just, sometimes it could be like a ride to the, ride to school in the morning or, um, you know, taking a bus at times, sometimes it sort of pushes your limits. But I remember, I don't know, finally is the right word, but my brother perhaps pushing my limits in the car. I'm pretty sure Chris, I push his limits all the time here Or, as Chris now knows, I can actually get there. 
Okay? For me, it also kind of reminds me of a sneeze. You get that weird feeling like you're going to sneeze? Sometimes you do. Sometimes you don't. Isn't it the worst feeling when you have to sneeze and then you don't sneeze? Okay? My husband hates it when I go, bless you, and then he doesn't sneeze. He's like, why do you do that? I'm like, because it's funny. Right? I do it every time. And he's like, I don't sneeze when you say bless you because when my sneeze doesn't come out, I'm like, like I control. Right? Your nose and your, you know, whole like ENT system here. Your ears, nose, and throat. He's like, I don't know why I don't sneeze when you say it. But try it on somebody. You know, it's like, good morning, my girl. Bless you, or look at the lights, or ha 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 ha, and see if they still sneeze. See the message that I got. Okay? Because I will sneeze either way. It makes no difference to me. Okay? Because it doesn't get in my head. It's like playing a sport or, you know, something where you're on a field and you can get in somebody else's head. That's like the best part of the game. When I played basketball, we used to play um, one of the private academies. And there was this really tall girl. We called her Moose. Okay? Because she kind of looked like Moose. And I don't know what, I never said it to her face. I'm pretty sure she would kill her. And she when we played basketball once. She said, Give me the ball! Okay, give me the ball. <laughs> and that's exactly what it looked like. Okay, and my coach was like, What are you doing, Jinx? And I was like, Well, she told me to give her the ball, so I gave her the ball. I mean, what would you do if a moose told you to give her the ball? And my coach was like, Sit on the bench! And I was like, Okay. Well, you told me to sit on the bench, I sat on the bench. The moose told me to give her the ball, I gave her the ball. I don't see anything wrong with this picture. Right? And then after I sat on the bench for a little while, she's like, okay, are you going to listen to the moose or are you going to play basketball? And I was like, I don't know. She's like, sit on the bench. Until I could say I'm going to play against the moose, okay, then I could play. But if I was going to do what the moose said to do, then I could go back and, I, if I was not going to do what the moose said to do, I could go back and do it. It took me like a long time, okay? Because, I mean, the moose had to be like this tall. It was like a moose, okay? I'm pretty sure she... When she came at me, every time I took a shot, she oh, it was ball. It's just easier, okay? Good day, okay? The expected behavior was I'm gonna give the moose the ball, okay? Because I'm not gonna make the shot anyway. Because all I see is the moose, okay? So it's just better off because I had to defend the moose. You know, here I am chasing this moose around. I felt like, you know, a hunter in the woods trying to catch the moose. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was going to feed the moose. Maybe it was going to pet the moose. I'm pretty sure I couldn't go up to the moose and be like, good moose, good moose. I was going to be kicked out of the gate. So it's easy, like, here's the moose, let's go play. Okay? My coach did not think any of those things were fun. I have to. Just say. I wouldn't do that to any of your coaches or, you know, anybody. Not funny. I thought it was hilarious. Okay? Because all these moves is like playing against a, you know, a NFL player. It's a she's tall, a bean, and we got ready to get back on court. So, I think we're running the Zelda. Don't know. She looks like a moose. So, the limits. Every single time you do a limit, you should know a limit. So, when we flip this over, and you see the word the abbreviation for limit, does, oops, sorry, it doesn't freak me out. Because as this function, whatever this is, gets closer and closer to infinity, we get out 2.7182, 2.7183, well, that's not completely true, that's a rounded approximation. Okay, and that's known as the natural base is 2.718, I won't even say 3, that freaks me out because I know that that's, not, that's just rounded. That's known as E. Kind of like pi is known as 3.141526535897923. Do you even know if I'm telling you the truth anymore? No. 
Well, this isn't completely true either, because E is an irrational number, just like pi. It never ends, it never repeats. That's why I said that's not the truth about E. Okay, so E doesn't really have a three there. That's what's freaking me out. E is really, here's part of E. I have pi there, like 10,000 digits. Not as many of E. But there's really not three there. That's what, when I'm looking at it rounded, I'm like, yeah, this isn't right, because I do know more digits of E, and you should as well. So you might want to fix E there, because it's 2.718281828. There's really not a three there at all, is there? So on your paper, you might want to write 2.7. 1, 8, 2, 8, 1, 8, 2, 8, because you can know at least that many, because it looks like it repeats, agree? 2.7, 1, 8, 2, 8, 1, 8, 2, 8. I said that like three times, you have to know that one, right? 2.7, 1, 8, 2, 8, 1, 8, 2, 8. Well, if I didn't know it was irrational, and that means it doesn't repeat and it doesn't end. I would have said it was 2.718281828182818281828281828 forever, right? So we know that's not true. We would just said it's like pi. It doesn't repeat and it doesn't end. So calculators, if you have those with you, you're welcome to grab it, it has E on it. We don't have to type in this limit statement. This is a calculus limit. And if I want to know what E is, there is an E above the division symbol here in blue. So I can go second E. Now, where does E pop up? We know where pi comes, right? It's in geometry all over the place. And we're going to use pi this year like my base business, maybe in a circle. So pi, we've seen a use of, like it's the circumference divided by the diameter, and whose out pops pi? 3.14152653599799. You're learning that I'm not, those numbers are right. I actually know pi to quite a few decimals. That E, where does E come from? Well, right there. Where do we use E? Where does it actually use in real life? True enough, those of you who are thinking about studying business, E happens quite a bit in the business world. Okay, E is often used with stocks and bonds and with money. E is a um, accounting number that happens more often than you would ever imagine. Whereas pi is more of the you know, mathematical circles number. Pi is related to circles. Okay, E is related to money. Who doesn't like money? Right? So if I hit E and then hit enter, well, there it is. 
2, 8, because the next one's 4, 5. And the 4 wouldn't round it up. But I do know that it's 4, 5. I just had you write that down. And I can prove that to you because I can simply take the 2 off. Oh, there's not a 4 there. Why doesn't it say 4, 5? Why does it say 5 instead of 4 if it's 4, 5? It rounds up. Okay, but of course, I can prove that to you because I can take the 7 off. Oh, and there's the 4, but there's no 5 because it rounds it up. There's more digits in your calculator than just what you see on your screen. It holds, you know, probably 40, 50 digits when you hit the E button. Okay, but it would be better to use the E button than type in 2.7183. Whenever we're going to type that number in our calculator, we're going to type E. So therefore, we would need our calculators. So it's time to get your hands on some calculators. Today, you're okay just following with us. So there's E. I'm not really going to explain where Euler's number comes from or Euler's number, if you want to go all the way back to geometry there, either way is pronounced correctly. Um, but it is irrational, it never repeats, it never ends. So if we want to graph something with the base of E, the first thing I would ask you, is it going to be exponential growth or exponential decay? How do you feel about this base? Growth or decay? Growth every single time. Because it's bigger than one. So that makes me, before I even want to graph it, go down here and look at number 15 and a feel kind of silly. Because it says, tell me the function in an example of exponential growth or exponential decay. Well, I think we can do that in one clean sweep. E, 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 E. How do you feel about all of those? They're all growth. Yeah, we could go back and talk about horizontal stretch, ver uh, vertical compression. We could talk about other things. But just because it has an E in it, it's automatically growth. So that's about the silliest question down here I could ask you. Easy enough? So we go back up here and we're going to graph it. So I'm going back to my chart that I would use for both of them. I'm still using this idea of 0, 1, 1 the base, 2 the base squared, negative 1 over 1 over the base, negative 2, 1 over the base squared. And, I mean, sometimes I can get 5 points, sometimes I can only get 2 or 3 points on my graph, because more even when we graph the other ones, like, you know, over 2, up 9 is off my graph. And without a calculator, I'm not going to be great at these. With a calculator, I can type anything in. So if I take the first couple and I put in zero, well, e to the zero is going to be what? One. Anything to the zero is one, including e. So we're going to still be at zero comma one. Wait, we didn't move this. So where's my asymptote going to be? Well, the zero. And there's no chart or anything here, so I would expect you to label it on your graph. If there's a chart, then I would, we don't have to label it, because I'm going to get that answer someplace. Okay, I'm going to go with the positives over 1, up 2.718281828445. Right, that's what I just said you should be required to know. Hint, 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 hint. I've now said that twice. If you don't know me very well, I'm telling you that that's probably going to be an assessment question. So over 1, up 2.718281828445. Now said that three times without my calculator. Okay, the next one I'm not going to memorize because I have no idea what 2.7 or 2.7183 squared is. I could estimate it if I said 2.7 is almost 3, 
Well, three squared is about nine. Okay, if I really want to know bad enough, I can take E and I can square it. But I'm not going to memorize this number. If I'm not going to memorize it, then you're probably not going to have to have it memorized. So it is 9. Actually, it's just a little bit more than 9. Go ahead. How about you, Pi? Good call. Oh, it's a little bit less than 9. Well, that makes a little bit more sense because I took 2.7 and I overestimated what that was equal to, right? So 9 should be bigger than what it actually is. Agree? Okay. So 7 is a little bit more. Well, the good news is that if I go over to about 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and a little bit, it's off my chart anyway. I could go that point anyway. If I go negative 1, I'm doing 1 over E. Well, that's like... 1 over 2, or 1 over 3, so it's someplace between a half and a third. Agree? So I'm not going to break out a river on you, but there it is. If I want to know bad enough, I could say that that's 1 divided by E. Well, that's 0 0.36. I said it was someplace, you know, around a half, a third. It's a little bit bigger than a third. The truth is, these three points give me enough to draw it. 1 over, one over e squared is going to be 1 over 7 point whatever we got. Again, that would be a total math calculation on the calculator. Not something I'm going to memorize. 0.135. Okay, it's smaller. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And I can name that point, negative 2, comma, 1 over e squared. And I can name all of the things that go with it, like x approaches negative infinity, x approaches positive infinity, we're good. No chart here for me to fill all that out. And there's my parent graph. We just graphed an natural base, base E. And funny enough, in calculus and in pre-calc, we use base E more than we do any other base. Okay, how about if I take this graph and remove a transformation? What's that negative going to do? Flip it over the x-axis or the y-axis? The y-axis. If it's going to flip it over the x-axis, it would look like this. This is a flip over the x-axis. The, the a would be negative. So we're going to flip it over the y-axis. So we're going to stay, if I take this asymptote, not going to move. If it flipped over the y-axis, it would stay in the same spot. Okay, this 0, 1, how do you feel about 0, 1? Would it move? No. Instead of going 1 to the right of what B, we would go 1 to the left and up 2.718. 2818, 2848, 45. And again, we would go over 2 to the left, and we just figured that out. That was 7 something. Again, I don't have it memorized because we just did it like two minutes ago. One to the right now, up one over B, so one half, one third. I think that was 0.36, so we just typed it in. It's probably still on the calculator. Yep, 0 0.367, 0 0.368, and then one over B squared, which I don't even remember because. I will never know that decimal. Put one through five if I look back at my calculator. Something I don't have memorized. And of course, if you really want to check yourself, I mean, you could type any of these in your calculator, but that's not our purpose. 
I mean, if you were home and you really wanted to check something, right, we could go to y equals, and we could type in e to the x, and we could hit Zoom Standard, and we could take a look at it, and see if it matches. But I want to make sure that we're also not putting it in our calculator and writing it down because then we're not going to know how to do what we're doing because we're going to have an assessment without a calculator. But if you're like, this just doesn't feel right. I mean, we did all of this back in Algebra 2 with our calculator and then discovered the transformations. So if you're feeling like, oh, this transformation doesn't feel right, I would do it first and then check yourself to see if you're right. I wouldn't do that to every problem because then you're doubting yourself. But if you're like, this just doesn't feel right, graph it, check it, and be like, oh, I did get that right. Look at me. Okay? And build your confidence up, but let's not graph it and then copy it. Because then you're in the wrong class. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay. The next little few at the bottom is just simply, can you use your calculator? Can you type these in, and more importantly, can you round to the thousands place? How many decimal places would be the thousands? Three. We always round to three decimal places. We did this last year, unless the direction so differently. If you round incorrectly, I'm sorry to break your heart, I would just mark the problem wrong. Because you are now in pre-calc honors, and you should know how to round. So not only is this, can you type things in your calculator, can you round? So if you're like, I got all this problem right, but I rounded wrong, I'm like, well, we should probably write a little note to your third and fourth grade teacher that you didn't learn how to round. That was before the pandemic, so that's still your fault, not their fault. Okay? So you can type these in and see if you get the correct answers. If you don't have your calculator, maybe you want to ask the person sitting next to you if they're kind enough to let you borrow theirs. Um, you will have Desmos on your computers. I'm not a big fan of because you can't use it on your assessments. I don't have any batteries yet. I'll work on that so you can borrow one from me. At least they are, there they are typed in. You can see if you can round correctly. Go ahead. Say that again. Absolutely not. If there's a zero before that decimal place, like here, I prefer you didn't write it. But that's a great question. I mean, I won't mark it wrong if, it, if it's there. I might write Y, but I won't mark it wrong. I'll check my batteries once you guys get working on the homework a little bit and see if I've got batteries that work or and calculators that work. Do you agree? So his question was, do I need a zero out in front of this? And my answer is no. I actually think they're ridiculous. But I need a zero here to hold the tenths place. That's not what he was asking. Okay, any questions so far? 
Okay, you didn't get a whole lot of practice with the transformations, so you're going to see some of those on the homework. So what we're going to do for homework is worksheet one one and 439, 447. I'm just going to check those to make sure that I'm okay with them. I'm just sure I am. They are on Schoology. So you can go to those pages. Let me just make sure that I am I am not. So no 439 and no 447 yet. Maybe by the end of the period, probably not. We have to do some models first, some word problems. So right now, just the worksheet. So just worksheet 1-1. I'm going to let you work on that for just a tad, and I will check out some of my calculators, even though I don't think you really need them. You may check your answers with each other. I'm going to do attendance and all of that good stuff, and then we're going to move on. So this will give you a little bit to get started on. Did I? It looks like I did pass around the whole time last time. Yes, no? Yes, okay. I can't remember which classes I did. And just for you, I hope I choose. So, all kinds of bases, all kinds of transformations have at it. You're more than welcome to work with the person sitting next to you. So, all of this is calculator. So, that way um, you can have your calculator to do this. Um, when you are uh, home, if you don't have your calculator, there's a calculator you can get on your phone, you can use those on your laptop if you need to. You can come see me after school, and you can use one of my calculators. Um, you saw that they're on the top right-hand drawer, so if you borrowed one, you can put it back there. Um, a great SAT formula. Funny enough, I just heard somebody say SAT. This is one that they don't give you, but you need every single time on your SAT for exponential growth and decay. Um, they talk about growth. Uh, I've every single essay, I've taken every SAT test, I think, except for maybe the last two. Um, and this formula is on there every single time, and they don't give it to you. So if we're talking about growth and decay, if we have a growth equation, A is always our initial amount. Same. These two formulas are exactly the same for me. As I look at them, for me, I think of them as y equals a 1 plus or minus r to the t. So I'm only really memorizing one formula. If it's growth, we increase by the rate, and we decrease if it's decaying because we want it to go down. So a is the initial amount that you have. You often do this in science, like how many cells you begin with. Okay, we're going to talk quite a bit about money, so if I'm going to put money in the bank, how much money am I putting in? Am I putting in $100? Am I putting in $5? Am I putting in $1,000? What is that initial amount? Um, the percent of increase. So if we're talking about money, what is my annual percentage rate? Am I getting 3%, 5%? You're not getting anything better than that. Okay, if you've got a credit card, then it's going to be they're charging you 19%. That's ridiculous. Okay, if you have a savings account, you're probably getting 5%. And that would be fantastic. You probably that would be like with the Apple Credit Union or you know, like Navy Credit Union. If you're dealing with a regular bank, it's like three percent would be great. Okay, and T is the time, almost always in years. But whatever this, so if we're getting our percent, 
then that would be when I said annual percentage rate, annual would imply years. Okay, if I'm getting a daily percentage rate, that would be fantastic. That means I'm looking at my money every day. So then my time would be in days. Okay, so these two things have to match however that works out. Okay, almost always if we're dealing with money, it's in years. Okay, if we're talking about cell division, then we might be talking about is it dividing every month, every day, what's happening, then these two things would have to agree. Okay, so often we use the same formula in other, like in a science class, then that time would have to match the rate at which they are dividing. Okay, just so, because they are, it is applicable in other places. So if we're going to use this formula, this one, I would say is probably the most used. And then as we go down the paper, we've got formulas that we would use for other purposes, probably not as useful. This is just that basic formula. Um, like I said, it's often on like an SAT or ACT or a standardized test. So here, we could use this for anything, anything that is growing or decaying. So in 1990, the cost of a state university was 4300 per year. Is that realistic to today? No. Okay? Not at all. We could look up a college um, that you're looking at, but I cannot think of anywhere in the state of Virginia that you can go to for 4300 per year. Okay? Uh, during the next eight years, the tuition rose 6% each year. Okay, you will learn very quickly I'm not a huge fan of James Madison because we used to play them in football and they're not very nice to the competitors. Okay, but they do not rise like this. They do not raise their tuition every year. That is one very great thing I can say about James Madison, about JMU. They believe in educating the students of Virginia. Okay, other schools have made a huge rise, especially after COVID. Why would schools be raising their tuition rate after COVID? What did COVID do to colleges? Did they make a lot of money during COVID? No. Nobody was living on campus. They didn't get any housing money, no food money. They weren't able to pay their teachers. Okay, they weren't able to pay like their um, cafeteria and salary, those kind of people. So they had to make that money up. Some colleges have even said they've gone up 17% each year because of after COVID. That's a lot. Okay, James Madison, as much as I don't care for them, JMU, they went 10, 12 years and never raised their tuition. Okay, I really just don't like the football program. Okay, they're Division I now, so we don't play them anymore. Delaware is not. Okay, good for them. I just don't want them to win. But they have a great school. They have a great education program there. I mean, great academics. It is a great college. I have nothing to say bad about that. I just don't like that they boo and they throw things at us and that kind of stuff. Okay, I think it's poor sportsmanship. But there's nothing wrong with their school. And the cost to go there is way cheaper than other places. Or at least it has been. They did have to have a little increase recently. But not much. They were like only 2% compared to like UVA and Virginia Tech that had to do 7 and 9%. Because they find a way to make that happen. Okay, right now, again, situation in dollars, T years after 1990. So 1990 is now T equals zero. Then find out the cost of tuition in the fall of 2000, where well, we can do 2005, we can do 2023, we can find any year you want to. So if we want to write an equation, then we're going to write this. It is growing. So we want y equals a, 1 plus r to the t. Well, what's the initial amount? What was the initial tuition? 4,300. It's rising, so I chose the one with the plus. So when plus the interest rate, what was the rate that they are rising? 6%. Of course, we have to write that as a decimal every two years. 
So we could leave it like that, but we could also, and I would take that. I have no problems with that. Now on an SAT test, they would ask you to add this together, and this would be often the number that you would double in, 1.06. Or they would ask you what this 1.06 meant. Okay, that means that it's rising 6%. They would just give you that equation. That means you're paying 100% of the tuition plus 6% more. It went up 6%. Well, what does the 4300 stand for? Well, that was the initial amount. Okay, so that takes care of the first part, right? The model, right there. And then we can write it for anything we want to after 1990. Well, if it wants me to say the fall of 2005, well, nobody cares about that. Let's do 2020. Uh, let's do, uh, what are you? Let's go with junior class. What is your fall of your freshman year? So 2023 is this year, 2024 is your senior year, 2025 is your first year. Let's do 2025. It's just going to get worse for sophomore or uh, freshman. So 2025 would be how many years later? After 1990. 35 years later? Okay, so where are we going to put in 35? Is that going for Y or T? T. Well, let's do it for that year. Nobody cares about 2025 or 2005. So 4,300 times 1.06 to the 35th. Now you need your calculator. If you're a sophomore and you want to put in 36, it's fine. If you're a freshman and you want to put in 37, I don't care. This is really all about you. Now, I put this in a little slower. I put in 1.06 raised to the 35th. That's really your effective yield. That means it's going to go up 7.686%. I'm not rounding there. And I'm going to multiply by that the initial amount. Wow. It could have started at $4,300, but you are going to pay $33,050.17 per year. And you're looking at, what, four years of college? So multiply that times four. And there's what your college is going to cost you, $132,200. And that's about what my stepdaughter paid. Where's her financial lens? She pays about $1,000 a month. Might be a conversation you need to start having with your parents. Oh, and I mean, 33000 is a little high. And if you go, especially if you go to a public school, she went to Salem, and that's about right. It was 20000 for tuition, and then room and board, and then transportation back and forth, etc. Wasn't that far off. She's probably a little bit under that. She probably financed about 100000 Just so you know. You might want to stay with the state institution. It's never look really good for a year or so. Or George Mason, and you could live at home and only pay for tuition. Just saying, it's not a bad choice. Okay. A diamond ring, anytime you purchase jewelry, it does not, real jewelry, by the way, not custom jewelry, um, it will not lose its value. You could trade it in a more, like a higher jewelry, and it will always have exactly what it was worth, if not more. Okay, so like family heirlooms, that kind of thing, never lose their value. Okay, so if you buy a diamond ring worth $500, it's always worth $500. It will never lose that value. It probably will gain value. Okay, just so you know. I mean, you could take it to a pawn shop, you're going to get less for it, but if you trade it in something that's worth more, you'll get $500, you might even get $1,000 for it. Okay, pawn shop's probably going to give you $300 for it, because they're going to turn around and try to sell it for 500 because they know it's worth 500 Totally different situation now. Okay, the value of the ring increased by 8% each year. And that's probably pretty fair. What was the value of the ring today? So, again, we're doing a growth equation. 
So it was $500. It's increasing by 8%. So I know I'm going to add 0 0.08. So by now, I know that that's 8%. And there's my equation. Um, how many years are we holding on to this ring? 20. So we're going to put in 20 there. Now, if you type something in wrong, that's your fault. I will tell you, if you write that equation and then you give me the wrong answer, I'll be able to throw you a point or two. If you don't show me any work and you just write down a magic answer and you're, I got nothing to grade but your final answer, well, then it's right or wrong. But if you show me some work, like the equation, okay, you don't know what they were doing, then I can give you a point, maybe even two. And how much is that diamond ring worth now? I mean, it's not worth $1, but you start off with a $500 ring, and it's getting down one. Would you agree? It might have been, you know, your parents, your grandparents, somebody's diamond ring. It did not, it will never lose value. A ruby, an emerald, a sapphire, anything that is an actual gemstone will never lose value. Like a costume, a fake, it's probably worth the same 50 cents you paid for it. Okay, but an actual will not. And no, even gold and silver is probably worth more than 8% all the time. Okay. A tool and die business. Okay, tool and die is like if you have on, like some of you have on like bulldogs or like your eagles or some kind of like where they make shirts and they print something on them, that's a tool and die business. Okay. Anytime you buy something like that or like a car, as soon as you purchase it, it decreases in value. You know as soon as you buy a car, when you drive it off the lot, it decreases in value instantaneously. Right, because now it's used. Even if you buy a used car, you take it off a lot, it's used again. Okay, so you could buy a $50,000 car, pull it off the lot, and now it's only worth like $45,000. You no longer have a brand new car, it's not worth the same. You wreck it or do something else to it, it decreases value just as fast. Okay, that's just the beast that it is. So a tour and buy business, so that's what's printing on shirts. You know, you go to the beach and it says, like, oh, Ocean City. Okay, that's, they just mass produce those shirts. All of our Bulldog shirts that say, you know, Bulldog this or Bulldog cross country, Bulldog whatever, track and field. That's made by a tool and buy business. Purchase a piece of equipment for $250,000. There's a lot of money. The value of the equipment depreciates at a rate of 12% each year. Okay, well, let's go to our equation. Uh, initial amount, $250,000. It's decreasing now, so I'm subtracting 12% per year. Now an exponential model for the value of the equipment. That's a good equation. Again, I'm still conditioned for standardized testing, even though we don't have a standardized test this year. I go ahead and subtract this. And that's an excellent SAT question. What does that 0.88 mean? It means that it decreased by 12%. But if you don't know this equation, you would never know what to say. What is the value of the equipment after five years? You've been in business for five years. You're barely making a profit. Well, you're putting in five for T. Wow. Make sure you round into the pennies. Of course, when we're rounding, always three decimals, unless we're talking money. And now we're rounding to the nearest penny. Five years, that equipment's almost half. Not quite half, but pretty close. 
if you're not making a profit in five years, that business is in trouble, would you agree? Sometimes I wonder why, like when you buy a sweatshirt, you know, it says Kentucky or Delaware or something on it. I'm like, why is this thing 30 bucks? It's just a sweatshirt or a t-shirt. Like, I mean, you know it took them, like, it cost them $5 to make this sweatshirt. But I had to pay, like, 12 you know, twelve fifty for it or something. But because they got to make money because that equipment is what's expensive. Not that t-shirt or putting that logo on it. Because that company's still making money. You can get cheaper stuff from a company that's been in business for a long time because they probably are starting to own that equipment because they've made so much stuff. A newer company is going to be more expensive because they're still paying for that equipment. But they may make fancier stuff because they've got more equipment, more technology. Just something to think about. You can get cooler stuff from a newer company, but it might cost you more because they're paying for that equipment. Because in five years, they can't sell that equipment. Because it, I mean, they can, but they're going to make very little profit on it. Okay, and some of that loss, you know, you can pay some of that, you can claim some of that on your taxes by being a business. There's way, I mean, there are things that help you, but you still are losing money, right? If you're not selling shirts and t-shirts and socks and frisbees and koozies and cups and, you know, things like this that say University of Delaware on them and everything else. Because you've got to be making money. Okay? So you got to buy everything with bulldogs on it. So those companies stay in business. Okay, compound interest. So now we up this a little bit. So now we go specifically to money. So formulas you need to know, I'm not going to give them to you. Basic growth and decay. So it's with everything. Works with science, works with anything we just want a simple growth and decay. Like how fast is our school population growing? Are we decaying? Okay. Clearly we are not. We still have learning colleges, aka trailers. Okay, we're still hiring staff. Okay, some elementary schools are, you know, they're down staff because they're smaller. We keep thinking that our high school is going to be smaller and we'll be down teachers. We'll finally like have enough rooms. Has not happened in the 23 years that I've been here. Okay, we built this high school and we had 41 trailers at one time. Okay, then we built this whole R way, R our wing. It was not here when we built this school. That's when we had 41 trailers. R for renovation. Don't you wonder why it goes from E to R? Like it's the emergency area. We are renovation area. This was not here. The building used to stop at E113. That's my old classroom. Where we ended. And then they built all of this because we had 41 trailers. We were exponentially growing. Okay, now we still have some trailers or learning cottages, and we're getting better, but we're still bigger than our school can handle. Look at your class size, right? We are still growing exponentially. A couple of my classes are up to 34 students, because we still have students enrolling. Okay, so it's not like we're getting smaller. I don't know what's happening in elementary school. I guess they cry, they get to stay home, I don't know. Okay, but we are not we are not decreasing. Now when we start talking about money, we start talking about compounding. Compounding means they start looking at your money and pay you interest. How many of you have a savings or a checking account? Like you have a, a debit card or, or something. Okay, you're probably getting your interest, you're probably getting paid interest on that account. You should have a free savings or checking account, okay, because you're a student. You should not be paying for that. So you should look at your bank and make sure that you are going on free because you are a full-time student, and that should happen all the way through college, okay? You can also have a free account if you keep so much money in your account. It might be $100, it might be $250, it might be $50, but you should be eligible for, it could be $0 if you're a full-time student. So you should be looking at that, okay, because you should be in, allowed to have a free account because you are a full-time student. Again, some banks may, will charge you after you graduate from college. You might want to look and see what that minimum is to have in your account. It can be very small. It can be like 100 bucks. You got to keep 100 bucks in there, and then it stays free. 
or you have a deposit made every month, month and it stays free. That's how mine works. I deposit my, my check gets automatically deposited and my all my accounts are free. And I'm going to take free. So if they compound my account, it looks very similar. As a matter of fact, if I take this N out, that looks exactly the same. P is my initial amount. They're going to compound it, so they're going to pay me money, so it's only going to increase. Free money, not completely true, but it is money that's getting added to my account. One plus the interest rate, that part stays the same. There's still a T there, but what changes is they take into account the number of times they compound it. So the number of times they look at my bank. Well, nobody goes and looks at my account and is like, oh, look, Jane is going to take it over and look at her account, and we're going to give her free money. First off, that's income, so you have to pay taxes on that. Okay, so it's not totally free. Should be free here because you're a full time student. For me, it's not free money. So every single time I look at my account, like a checking account, they're probably looking at it every month. An actual person doesn't do that. Now it's all computer regulated. So the number of times that they look at it, they divide the interest rate by that. So they're not going to give me 4% every single month. Okay, there's no way. They're going to take that 4% annual interest rate. And we're going to divide that by the number of times that they're going to compound it. So if it's an annual interest rate, they're going to take that 4% divided by 12. Because they're looking at it every month. And then they're going to multiply that number of times they compound it times the years. Okay, if they look at it every, they look at it twice a year, then they're going to take that annual interest rate, 4% divided by 2. Or by, yeah, so they give me 2%. At the beginning of the year and 2% the second half of the year. So they still only give me a total of 4%. I can't give them to give me 4% every month because then they would really be giving me about 48%. Okay, then that'd be glorious. Okay, then I'm going to put all my money in that account because there's nobody in their right mind going to give me 48% interest rate. Because then we're all going to get every single penny we can find on the ground and we're going to put it in that account. Because by the end of this year, folks, we will be making some money. Right? So they're going to take that and divide. So they could take this money and they could look at it at different times. They could look at it annually, means once a year. They could look at it quarterly. What do you think that's going to be? Four times a year. They could look at it monthly, which means once a month. And they could look at it daily. Which one of these do you think would give us the most money? Annually, quarterly, monthly, or every day? Yes. I mean, you're really just kind of guessing. You probably don't know a whole lot about money. Daily. The more they look at my money, because if they only look at it once a year, once a year they're going to look at it like on a dumb day. Like the day after Christmas or winter holiday. Or the day after, like the day before I get paid, like this week, we'll be paid next week. So the government gets paid on the 1st and the 15th. So they look at it on the 30th and the 14th. They still do that anyway, if they do it monthly. They also look at it like on the 14th. Because they don't want to give you money. Right? It's, it's not like it's a store where it has to benefit you. I mean, they're FDIC insured, which means your money's insured, but they don't want to actually give you money. Think about it. Okay, so they don't do it on like the 2nd or the 16th. Okay, we're going this next class. Bring your calculators. The only thing you have for homework is your worksheet. If you buy the calculator, put it back, please. And you're right. The more I look at my